Ghost Man. Horror Host Podcast UK, The Replicant, by Drake Foam. I splashed a handful of water across my sun-drenched brow, seeking the relief from o- o- the overheated workout. I pushed myself hard on tre- the treadmill, cranking the speed to seven for f- final minutes as the water drizzled down the basin. My eyes spun towards a black and white photograph. Hanging on the wall, I grasped at a resolution, but I, but I since my friend Sam was in the picture. The photo was at least 30 years old, if not more. Turned to Jim, who was self-proclaimed genius of bodybuilding and muscular. Pictures of the founders on the spot littered the walls. This one displayed a young bodybuilder, who would later become a global movie sensation. He sat in the left of the frame, while a dozen others were grouped beside him. His youthful appearance dated the photo, so he knew the man standing in the far right corner could be, couldn't be Sam, since he would have not been a child back then. I wondered how I missed spotting the similarities between four. I wasn't a bodybuilder, and my middle-aged gut said my picture, no picture of me would ever don those walls. The Italian was my regular gym, so he must have seen his photos hundreds of times without... Once noticing the likeness to my friend, I grinned, towed my face, and fetched my cell phone from my room bag. Sam would get a, such a kick discovering his doppelganger standing near the famous actor. He always shared funky link, funny links on the internet, consistently trying to top each other with the most witty and outrageous story. I snapped a photo and texted it to him. I knew it wouldn't take long for Sam to respond, but I was surprised when my phone buzzed only seconds later. Not only had the, in, the instead of texting one of my, his typical size between replies, he was calling me on occasion. We met for drinks, but most of our communications came from a screen of one sort or another for life of me. I couldn't recall the last time we talked to, on the phone. Sam, I rep- answered. Drop everything you're doing and get over here. He sounded frantic, almost hysterical. I splashed a handful of water across my sweat stretched brow, seeking relief. Miss Jane, I'll be back after my workout. Can't it this way? I zip my gym bag and it is exited the bathroom. Life and death, Fred. Life and death, he repeated. Oh, okay, relax, I'm on my way. Sam wrapped, my back, wrapped the back of his neck while pacing across the living room. I glanced from my seat mid crouch while pinning a little bit of a label from his fancy craft beer he'd given me. If it hadn't spat whatever this might was in my was in my mind by the time I finished the beer I I needed a, a reason to bounce my wife Joanna wasn't too pleased when I called her to tell her I'd be late she scolded me for breaking my promise to fix Dalton's bike this afternoon the brakes did not need, did twe- need tweaking but it hardly mattered since the boy ro- barely rode it anymore he seemed to seemed to interest these days for his upcoming driver's permit and soon the bike would be would hang dusty in the garage, so he couldn't understand Joanna's sky falling attitude towards fixing it. He felt kept envisioning Dalton as a little boy who picked at his nose and adored riddles, rather than the young men giving up comic books and toys for an ambitious interesting ambitious interesting girls. No way would he pour his girlfriend Cassie on the back of that happy Joanna had just loathed watching him grow. She even protested that I would put a look of his locker but I put a lock on his bedroom door and somehow you would prevent that development she could prevent the development. You saw it at the gym? So Sam asked, breathing the breaking the silence. I told him to tell him. I shifted my seat and tore another chunk from the Bobia's label. I knew I shouldn't be drinking after the workout. 
but the such tasted heavily to my parched lips. You can't go back. Sam's eyes widened with deadly seriousness. Afraid someone might recognise you as a former bodybuilder, I asked. Or maybe you don't want anyone to realise you're a never aging vampire. It's not that. Bad things happen when it arrives. What, a doppelganger? Your doppelganger? It's Matt. Come on, what's really going on? It's not a doppelganger, not at least in real life. Replicas only comes in photos. Sam Sam stared, staring in another direction before sitting at a seat next to him on the couch. So has this happened before? Sam nodded and swallowed a mouthful of air. You see, it always happens. Don't realize, didn't realize we knew each other that after that, each other that long, eight or nine years. I remember the party we first met. We related off color jokes, and discussed art from Roman Germany, connecting right off the bat. I didn't count, didn't go, didn't do the count with you. I'm sorry, I had no idea how much time had passed. Sam cursed and slapped the couch. Easy now. What? About this count, did you ever wonder why my relationship never lasted longer than three years? Why I never had children? I thought you were lucky, I chuckled. Don't you enjoy the pray life, life? No, I'm cursed. I had a laugh at that. If there's anyone in the world who wasn't cursed, it was Sam. He was handsome, healthy, and from what I had gathered, earned quite a salary as a search for a nearby government vet think tank. It's true, the first time it happened... Was in a kid we hang on at this hockey playing video games and air hockey. I still remember the place. It had this rickety fountain machine that sold soldiers for a quarter. Half the time the cup wouldn't stop and get covered in sticky glue. I remember the arcade. Boy, what a game's changed since then. I'm pantomime since playing with a joystick. More violent, but at least the kids are safe at home. In these days, they've always certain certain stretch factor at the arcade. The old teens could drink beer near the pool tables, while constant cloud of Miranda Warner wafted the, through the air. As a parent, I'm, I'm thankful for the change. At least he was reminiscing. I re- rearranged my bed to bottle to cheer, but Sam snapped straight up. We're friends, so you deserve the truth. I motioned for him to continue, and he told me about his former best friend, Ronnie, who paled around him at the arcade. They spent every hour with, together, oftentimes up to mischief. I was surprised to hear. Sam described his habit of shoplifting since these days. He didn't quite much as swear. Back then, he and Ronnie would steal anything from candy to old blue cassettes. To the ultimate prize, a pornographic magazine. Always it would head to the American arcade to divvy up the loot. To annoy, to avoid being noticed, they preferred goods. They hung near the, the opposite games off in the corner. Nobody went there, so sometimes they hid the loot behind the consoles. Back at home, their curious mothers might discover it. This was the case when Ronnie discovered the photo. A week before, he stashed a porno behind a broken car racing game, but I could not find it anywhere. Sam recalled how Ronnie's fingers were stained with sm- when from sm- smoking, snacking on dyed pistachios, and how he left smudgy red fingerprints while tugging on the machine after the machine and his fruitless quest for finding for the f- missing dirty magazines. Ronnie was about to give up when he heaved one final machine, 
and a dusty photograph tumbled out from behind. When he picked it up, he roared in delight. In it, a group of children were sitting down a steep hill. The child in the rear looked exactly like Sam. It wasn't him, though. That was... They had quite a laugh of it. Ronnie witnessed it set in fact up by her. Of the storyline in the comic book he was reading, Sam didn't think much of the photo till the, till the three days later. At the time, Sam's mother was helping out having one of her fits when she watched was what they call her psychotic breaks. So you wouldn't have been able to play with Ronnie. But when, nor had they been to the arcade to witness the shower of bullets that had impaled his best friend in the chest. The photo is the only thing in Ronnie's pocket when he died. And giving it to him, Sam tossed the cursed thing out. So the name replica, name, oh, the name replica name struck. As was when, that was what he called it when another photo of him appeared during his senior year at college. At this time, he was dating Cynthia, a girl well known since they both Cynthia Volfies. She was perfect for him, smart, and beautiful in an old folk way. She had long purple hair, a nose ring, and tattoos far beyond that reached the mainstream popularity. After Ronnie's death, Sam had retreated into his books, barely socialising throughout high school. When he began college, he spent the majority of the evenings locked inside his dorm room. His greatest fear was everyone on campus would see through his clean-cut exterior. Gawk in his whole chaotic home life. His mother's condition was worsened where, where unless she was constantly washed, washed. He hurt herself. Leaving for college, even if only on the other side of Los Angeles, had left Sam feeling vulnerable and guilt ridden. After without a father, his aging grandmother had taken the role of caretaker of his mum and he feared she wasn't up to the job. Worse, the next closest friend was his mum's psychic, whose only real foretelling skill involved discovering new items of to fleece from her. What impressed Sam most about Cynthia was her ability to wear her defunction with pride. I like the other girls opposed all ratter. All proper, like procreating for the boy, Cynthia spoke her mind, no matter how or putting. As a relationship button, they recounted stories of their broken homes. Finding common themes, Sam never thought he would tell anyone. But more than that, they shared music, a passion they indulged almost as frequently as their love life. Due to their shared favour, they played records of second, local second-hand store. Their campus became one of their favourite hangouts. Compact discs were relatively new at that point, so everyone was selling their old records collection up, up to upgrade. Everyone but Sim, Sam and Sylvia, they bought whatever they could afford, rifling for the dollar bin to almost on uh, an almost daily process. A manager at Ray Bay Records knew them both and would sometimes save some of the most interesting albums in the rear. Cynthia had always been, whenever she entered the store, and no problem flirting with the employees if she thought it might lead to a discount. Although, at the end of the day, she always ended up with Sam, sharing the new tunes. She did keep one album a secret. It was midterm week, so he wouldn't have been around. Instead, spending his time studying in the library, she insisted, to meet, she insisted it, he meet up to witness the score of a lifetime. He had blown her off to catch up with his reading. Sam paused as a smattering of tears welled his on his eyes. He remembered something inaudible and sniffed. My beer was so empty. I looked, broke the silence by offering a fetch a refill. I, he agreed. I could return. He can recompose himself enough to continue. He scoured the police reports afterwards, unable to comprehend the news. One of the players of Repay Records had discovered a Belgian import with guitars resembling Sam. He used it to lure Cynthia into the storage room. They made an advance. She politely refused. He kept pressing. The other players heard the commotion when he locked the door, so they were helpless as they tackled him. As she, as he, they, they would, as they, they were helpless as he tackled her to the floor. The crazy employee had a hunting knife, which he used to shear off her dress. They hung, dug too deep, and slashed her shoulder. 
She shrieked. She yelled to shut up, stating she knew nothing about pain. What did he? Not like he did. When she refused to stop, he decided to teach her a lesson by severing her left right nipple. I choked on a mouthful of foamy beer and almost sprang up. Sam was rocking on the couch. So I reached to steady him, but I snapped my he snapped my arm away. Something in my startled expression might have caught him, since he bowled over his head and started settled. I visited her every day while she was in hospital, but after she was released, she decided to travel to her father's house in Ohio. I insisted on coming along, but she told me she needed space, so I expected that. How couldn't I? Not after that. Oh, not after what she enjoyed, of course, I replied. She killed herself there. I'm sorry. I never meant to trick off this for that photo. Let's see if... Let's just forget I sent it. I ever sent it. I checked my watch and realised time, but I couldn't give up and leave after that. What? What do you think that rep cut tension was the first that appeared after Cynthia? Sam chuckled. They keep coming and coming every time I meet someone. Uh, eventually, it displays its rotten claws. Happens so often. I know as that number of days, 987. What weird curse, not 666 or anything. Something that makes sense. Sam, Sam, what's more? No, it's worth more, but it emerged as a crackle. Oh, my sinister. Nothing's going to happen to me, I assured him. I know Sam for a long time, but I didn't believe this nonsense. I sensed he might be stepping down the same path with his psychotic mother. I wonder about the best part to suggest his seek, the best way to, to, to seek therapeutic help. I know nothing's going to happen to you, Fred. I so exhaled, hoping you regained his senses. As long as you never return to where you spotted the replica, you'll be fine. Oh, our relationship's over. Our boys will keep coming and coming. Don't say that. You know I'll always be there for you. I, I wrapped my arm across his shoulders. Promise you never go back to Toronto. I nodded in agreement, even though I did not mean it. I rubbed my hands together while clearing at Sam's condom. A brisk wind slapped my face. I waited for a fleecy hug at the moment of the morning sun. I stood at a cardboard for over an hour in the dark, lingering like a crazy stalker. I guess, in a sense, I was, as much as I could ignore his kooky behaviour during our last visit. When, I came, when it came to my son, this did, could not be dismissed. I promised I would not hit him, but the longer I lo loitered in the cold, the more my hands knotted into pink knuckle fist. I thought about texting while considering Sam had ignored all my attempts to communicate for the previous two weeks. It seemed like a fruitful gesture. According to Marie, our mutual friend, I didn't need to worry. She checked up on Sam after sensing my concern, even though I didn't, I hadn't gone into details of my our peculiar conversation. According to her, he was fine, sober, and appeared mentally sound. I insisted he required help. She used to, get, used to get involved in whatever beef was going on between us. I relented, deciding I couldn't get help until he was ready to ask for it. So I stopped trying to contact him, hoping space might heal the relationship. I even avoided going to Tatium, perhaps believing if I followed his always hill rules, things would get better between us. Or maybe that was his excuse I needed to be lazy. Either way, I was never... Athletic, not taking two weeks off for any physical release, had left me feeling cranky, depressed. So when Dalton returned home yesterday and told me that it had happened, I already primed to explode. Bad enough Sam had tried to contact me through his passive, aggressive manner, but involving my son had taken a step too far. I could handle a hand grenade toss into a relationship, but never one flung at my family. As the front door... The Tosan's condo opened. I pressed close to the shadows, waiting for his approach. I strode with my black pace to wall, perhaps fearing for late work. I hoped he was was much of a rush, since there was a couple of things that needed to be discussed. 
My son, really? What was the matter with you? I I lunged to blocking his path. I understand, Fred, I do. Sound cranked to a halt, but not his head calm, his voice sounded un- measured and assured. Relax. You don't understand. I leaned closer and grinded my teeth. What? You think you're the first um, to ambush me? He rubbed his hands together and peered up. Okay, please go and tell them how I'm crazy. How I t- I'm what the one with all the riches. How you upset and and sighted how things how things will go back now I look a fool I'll miss everything my son when I come it comes to meet him I found him and say you don't want to know how I really feel no I don't he glared at me I don't know how, about you or your son because I didn't even need you to be hurt you must think I'm an imbecile to believe that I yanked out a collectible card Tony Dalton gave me yesterday. A man pitching a car was an obviously Sam. He was dressed like an athletic uniform, number 38, and cut a lacrosse stick across his chest. He sported a massive grin, as if scoring a winning goal, or perhaps a practic prank. That's not me, Sam insisted. No, it's Jesse Boyle. That was the name printed on the card, but when I checked the roster of the Hawaii machine, nobody... That name would ever play to a cross for them. The internet made tracking down any kind of in, that kind of information quite simple. The only reason Dalton had decided to show me the card was because Jesse Boyle wasn't listed on the trading sites, and he hoped it might have had some rare value. When I saw it, I exploded, but demanding to know how he found it. He told me he'd ridden his bike on the from in his boardwalk to watch his friend skateboarding at the rink and while his back was turned so Joker peppered his well, bike spokes with a grease trading cards, cards how long were you watching my son till you till you be, could creep up and plant this on him what kind of weirdo are you I told you the truth yet already if you didn't meet anymore otherwise you would be in great danger Sam folded his arms and nodded as if he holding a toddler. Oh, as all these things was, wasn't he doing. Until this point, I never knew the path, depth of his pathology. A curse, I know, but but I had some kind of time to think. First option is you're telling the truth. Even so, what kind of friend doesn't give an up about something like that? No warnings, no, not a single word, eat nothing. I told people before, not, but they always end badly. So I stopped. Second, I continued, ignoring his separate excuse of being such a rotten friend. This is a metal make believe, and notice his cries have been noticed. So when I, so when I know your nonsense, you target my son, knowing that you'll get attention. While I'm here. What do you need to say? Nothing. Sam stared at the ground. I get it. You know, you need to know where you got had my attention. You wanted it. I never knew you messed up. You, you are. Don't worry about get, get any great harm coming to us meeting since this will be the last time I see ever see you. Where did your son find that card? Sam glanced at me. Enough, I yield. I, you'll never mention my son again, and if you find anyone near him, not only will I have the police to worry about, but I'll come after you, understand? It's important to know where he is. Do you understand? All right. I interrupted him and first stopped. He nodded. Good. Now, go eat a bullet and make the place world a better place. I dropped a point forty-five and stormed off to leave him pondering that. Two could play these great danger game. No, I don't mean it. I grunted, offloading the three bikes from the rear of the suburb forest, so Dalton grabbed a crazy, wheeling him forward the rack situated from on the sidewalk next to the centre of the place. Well, he brought along his own lock and chained the bikes together, and I assumed he was quite a mate. What was a quite romantic gesture? I grinned, though Dalton made it clear that my role was set on was that as distantly as possible. It wasn't feasibly after something with anything, if anything, with fam. And when Dalton had asked me to drive him to the movies, I assisted him tagging along. I had no interest in super interest Jessica. I needed to see, but the bike rode the, but the bike ride down the page path. Afterwards, sounded nice. They would be fine without me 
at the movie. I waited in the lobby until they disappeared inside. Then I took a stroll inside around the perimeter of the mall, scanning all the shoppers. No sign of Sam. As I stood atop the third story, glaring into the open hand courtyard in the centre, I got an itch to work out. The movie spanned almost three hours, so I had time to hit the treadmill and be back for the credits. More than anything, I loathed being on constant watch, and I realised now Sam's paranoia crept into my head. The idea of escaping into my music and sprinting away all my troubles sounded ideal. Standing there on my watch was only evaluating Sam's madness. I need, felt the need to prove him wrong. So I made a decision. Sam talks and attacks of my plan. Headed over to Trinitronium. However, before I dashed into the rear of the jumped or a treadmill, I made a stop to prove my point. I entered the bathroom to photo Sam replica hanging on the wall. The picture hadn't changed since my last visit. I kissed two outstretched fingers and tapped it. Once on the treadmill, I started with a brisk pace. After ten minutes, it increased the speed to five. And usually, I ran at six and a half, but it had taken some time off, I found five a bit taxing. I cracked the level of my headphones, blasting punk music from my youth. A basketball play game played on one of the TV sets hanging from the ceiling. That's why I imagined dashing down the ground, ready for the game-winning shot. It wasn't until the game ended that when I noticed the trip, I bumped into a slight incline. Less than ten minutes of remaining, I had lost most of my juice. So I hit the button to lower it. The gears remained in one pla- in place, so I pressed again. The treadmill remained stuck. When I squeezed a third time, did it shudder? But instead of lowering, it began to rise. I almost tripped, but managed to keep the pace until it locked its incline. I wanted to raise it any more, and so close to finishing, I said to let, leave the incline buttons alone and hit the switch for speed. I knew that for certain, once I raised and lowered it throughout the run, but when I pressed the power to button slow down, the treadmill wheezed, speeding up. My feet held towards the bridging rubber mat as I jammed out my thumb against the switch. The adjoining indicator displayed a set of phoning numbers. The treadmill accelerated him faster. I coughed and was hacking at my own lunch. Suddenly enough was enough. I hit the stop button. Nothing happened. I heaved every breath after breath. Attempting to keep pace with this wild machine, the clock continued to count down, and less than five second minutes remained. I doubted I could, leap, could last another thirty seconds at a minute pace, so I grabbed in onto the side railings, leaping to jump off. When my fingers pressed against the manhold, I fumbled, unable to find a grip. I was drenched in sweat, so I wondered if this was why it was so slick. I peered and noticed a wet grass coating on the railing, almost appearing like oil. When I hit it, the light hit, it shone deep, bright, dark red, too close to the colour of blood. Looking down was a mistake. I tripped and toppled at the front panel, it too covered with its thick stick coating. Somehow I managed to keep my footing before slipping off completely. I peered towards the neighbouring machine. Not a single eye glanced in my direction. I smacked the front panel, f- hoping to spark my atten- any attention. Nobody looked. I, want, I would be sc- would scream, just breathing, consumed all my two minutes remaining step by grass. I could do this step, grass, grass, grass. When my reserve drives trained, I was in my struggle to maintain a sharp pain sprawled in my right toe as a blister formed in my, between my toes. I grated in the teeth and the back wave flooded over my vision, dizzy, or my brink of collapse. I closed my eyes and I peeked again. Only a single second had lapsed. Two, one, two, three, four, I counted in my head. This time an entire minute had tricked away. It made no sense because I could even begin to comprehend this. Adjusting angrily, spliced up my leg as the muscle seized. I, gla- I glared at the counter. Forty seconds. Forty long seconds. The curse, Sam's curse. Thinking of this sprouted a rage. 
from the merciless deep inside me. I didn't stop. I couldn't stop this evil. But I'd be damned if I was going to allow it to be get to the best of me. Not for forty seconds. I groaned and increased my strides instead of jamming the buttons on the treadmill. My thumb hit the volume for the music. A thump of guitar which sh- shattered through my skull. That bastard will win. No, I wouldn't allow that. The counter hit zero. I expected the cursed treadmill to continue, but instead it switched up into normal cooldown mode, switched something down to a call. I turned, lunged off the dome with no problem. As soon as I hit the floor, hit the floor, I dropped in the couch, waiting for my heart to settle. You done with that? A bony man asked. All yours. Most times it's concerned for the free machine over my well-being. Seems to infatuate me, but I... Just thankful for the solid round. I got my workout bag and hobbled towards the exit. I wonder if Sam could have rigged the treadmill to be my function by a foul rang. Jonas was irate, demanding to know why I hadn't answered it previously. I noticed seven, eight missed calls. Odd, I hadn't made a, heard a single one. I apologised and asked them about the emergency. She told me Dalton had text about breaking up Casey and no longer... Having the will to live, I rolled my eyes, knowing this was nothing more than a teenage drama. I told her not to panic and tried talking to him. After she hung up, I dialed Trenton's number. He received no answer. Somehow, after the treadmill, the, after the manic treadmill, I couldn't get worked up after my son's over my son's broken heart. I glided into the forest. He had a deep sigh and felt tremendous. For tremendous to be sitting down, I was grateful for surviving whatever occurred inside. I shifted the gear, reverse into my cell ring. I hit the button, dashed the archive, the Bluetooth connection. Jenna's voice hummed from the voice I overheard, overheard. Where are you? she demanded. At the gym, I answered. Casey's mum's rung. There was a fight during the movie and Dalton stormed out. She's furious. Casey's all alone. Why did you think it was a good idea to go to work out when you're supposed to be chaperoning? It certainly was. It certainly wasn't. It certainly wasn't. It was not a good idea. I don't. But Jonah didn't laugh. Okay, I'm ahead then right now. Be quick. The connection hissed as it broke up. A German accelerator speeding towards a lot. The area was clear. The bright room area was confined to furnace. And last one, I started falling back. My, by the time I spotted a blur, I knew too moving too quick to dodge. But not only that, I was accelerating as it wanted an accident. When I collided, I thought a dark dog was some escape for the leech. When I rushed out to investigate, it wasn't a dog; it was Dalton. Trying to blame me for forgetting to fix the brakes in the boy's bike, but I, I kept the fact that he's he's separated from her. I know she blamed. Dalton, seeing a teenage overaction, that heartache, but I know better now. I had a lot of time to think of here. Prison is good for that. I have no doubt that's about Sam's curse anymore. I cannot explain why. The way that treadmill with Dalton sort of race into the air. We are my severe I didn't think he'd sped up. The bike did. More than anything, what convinced me? That the dreams, a dream of Dalton, often. Every, from when he was a baby to those goofy poses he did at the last year's vocation in Hawaii. But one thing is constant in every dream his face. But I didn't see Dalton's face. I saw it in my nightmares. It was Sam's, it superposed on his body every time without a fail. Worse yesterday. I spied Sam's replica in a book checked out from the, light of the prison library. My senses fed a fact to amend this also. It was, is it longer expected to be released for next month? I fear that will never happen.